off the ground here. And there are people who are well-known national politicians, again, Birgitta uh, Jonsson and Ogmundur Jonasson, are both very well-known and highly regarded. They're respected. They're considered honest, uh, you know, not part of the system. They could become the focus for, for mass support, and I, and I certainly hope so. Uh, naturally, from the U.S. point of view, U.S. tradition, you always have to be for the underdog, right? You got to be for the. Uh, you can't be for the favorite. That's that's no fun. So in this case, it's Iceland against the British and the Dutch and the IMF and the European Union. It would, from the U.S. point of view, it's also essential. You don't want instability in Iceland in the North Atlantic because it controls all the sea land. You want to have a nice, orderly government there. Where do people the find this info, want. Webster? What's your website, really quickly? I'm at uh, tarpley.net, www.tarpley.net, and some of these papers are at actindependent.org as well. All right, we'll be back right after this. It's the Info Warrior. We are back. It's the Info Warrior with Jason Burmis. I am joined by Webster Tarpley, and I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to get your take, Webster, on all these headlines now admitting the death of the dollar, including the Washington Times, the Independent, Reuters is reporting it. Uh, there are also some reports out there that the oil-rich nations are going to be shifting away from the dollar and into the euro. I want to get your take on that. Why are they coming out and announcing it at this point? Well, I think there are a number of things happening. Uh, it, it is certainly true uh, in a general historical sense that the uh, dominion of the dollar as the sole reserve currency of, of the world is now obsolete and has to be brought to an end. But the big question is how. This can be done in a chaotic way, which leads to a world catastrophe. Uh, the bottom can fall out all over the world, thanks to the fact that we have these derivatives. Or it can be done in an orderly and positive way if it's based on uh, negotiation. Now, the problems with negotiation are obviously the Obama regime, which has got this guy Geithner, who's on the phone <laughs> every day. Geithner is on the phone with Blankfein of Goldman Sachs, with Pandit the Bandit of Citibank, and with Diamond of J.P. Morgan Chase. And those are the people who tell uh, Tiny Tim Geithner what to do. So these are not people who are going to be interested in negotiating. And Obama himself is, of course, as a Wall Street puppet, a tremendous uh, barrier to this. But let's look a little bit beyond it, because something needs to be done. The, the problem you have in the middle of all this is the British. Uh, the British always play the role of treachery, wrecker. Uh, they're always trying to shift the consequences of the world economic depression, which they've taken a leading role in creating, especially through ideas and policies. And the role of Gordon Brown in this crisis has been, he's the guy who came up with the first bailouts, right? The U.S. was following in the wake of Gordon Brown. He's pursuing a typical British beggar my neighbor policy. It's always what the British have always done in the 1930s and today. Uh, you, you had this headline about London is now passing New York as the great uh, financial center. That's their goal. That has always been their goal. Uh, in 2007, most recently, the British kept their interest rates very high, trying to attract hot money and, and pass New York. That led to the, the Northern Rock bankruptcy, uh, because the British were simply too weak to do what they were trying to do. In 2008, you can make a very good case that the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers was helped along decisively by the British during that famous uh, Lehman Brothers weekend on the 12th and 13th and 14th of, of uh, September last year. The uh, people at the New York Fed were looking for a buyer for Lehman Brothers in the same way that, uh, that uh, Bear Stearns had been bought by J.P. Morgan Chase back in March. And the buyer that emerged was Barclays Bank of Great Britain. And this seemed to be the working hypothesis all through Saturday, Sunday, until about 5 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, when the word came that the British regulators, who are people you never hear from, they're the weakest of all regulators really anywhere in the world, they, were, they said, no, we, we're blocking this sale. And this meant that it was so late in the day there was no opportunity 
to come up with an alternative. You didn't have time to organize somebody else to buy it, and Japan was about to open, so at that point they simply had to have protection from the creditors. So in, in a way, uh, Gordon Brown and, and this British policy of treachery and beggar my neighbor was one of the reasons we got into this in the first place. The general idea is that when there's a depression, the British try to use it, in, in this case, was to bring down the dollar, to bring down the euro, if they could do that, and let the pound reassert itself and the city of London as the financial center of the world. Now, that's why it's interesting. This report on the, uh, the international operation to uh, replace the dollar as the uh, currency for the posted price of oil. This comes from this guy, uh, Robert Fisk, of the London Independent. Mm -hmm. And this is a British intelligence figure who's been sitting in Beirut for low these many years. And he writes interesting things about the Middle East. He's a, he's a great critic of the U.S. policy in, uh, in Iraq and in Afghanistan and vis-a-vis and -vis Iran and all these other things. It's very easy to be anti-American uh, when you have you know, mad dog regimes like we've had. But if you dig a little bit deeper, you will find that there is a particularly venomous kind of British anti-Americanism. This is the resentment, the hatred of, uh, of the washed-up empire, in other words, the has-beens of the imperial world, uh, trying to, to reassert themselves. And I think that's what's coming. If you look at this, uh, this television network, Al Jazeera, they've also been pushing the Fisk analysis. And the idea there is, these, these are, it's mainly run by the British. The, the English-language version, version of Al Jazeera featuring Fisk is totally dominated by British who are foaming at the mouth against the U.S. And again, from my point of view, they do it for all the wrong reasons. Um, so th let's, let's focus on that, first of all. Mm -hmm. the, the idea would be now, the, the article alleges that we've got Russia, China, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, the Gulf Arabs in other words, that are teaming up perhaps with maybe France, according to some versions, and maybe Japan, in uh, <clears throat> changing from the dollar to something else for the, for the price of, uh, of oil. Now, up to a certain point, this is fine. Uh, Iran has just done this. Uh, Iran has now shifted to pretty much uh, overwhelming use of the euro, and that, they've been doing that for a while. Uh, the question now is, if you simply remove the dollar from the picture... Uh, in a very brusque and kind of unilateral way, you will collapse the, the dollar. I, I think the people who were writing about this, some of them uh, don't realize how, how uh, vulnerable and fragile the dollar is. The British do, but some of these others may not, like the Chinese. The Chinese are sitting there with $1.5 trillion to $2 trillion. And if they do what they say they're planning to do, they will end up with nothing. In other words, once you start uh, saying that the oil will no longer be priced in, in dollars, and that will be pretty much worldwide, the demand for dollars will, will significantly collapse, and the dollar will collapse, and you'll go into a catastrophic implosion of the entire U.S. economy. Now, they may, they may think that that can be limited to the United States. It can't be. This is why it's so important to do this in a, in a concerted and negotiated way. It's the opposite of the British approach, which would be to try to collapse the U.S. as a matter of, of policy, and then if they can after that, collapse the European Union. In other words, the British are playing the, the dirtiest conceivable game of treachery uh, with Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown, of course, is on his way out, right? He's finished, so he would like to crown his career with... Uh, with something horrendous like this. In fact, all the headlines over at the Telegraph and the Guardian are hailing Cameron as the savior, and he's got this great plan. Continue. Yeah, the, again, the, this imperialist uh, urge, uh, it just it's like Freddy, right? It keeps coming back, right? Like these horror movies <laughs> that you see on TV around this time of year. Uh, obviously, what you would need is a negotiated agreement to have a new world monetary system where the dollar would be uh, joined by the euro, the yen, the ruble, uh, a possible Arab regional currency, which has been in the works for quite a while, and indeed a Latin American regional currency. And if you could establish fixed parities among them, and if you could establish gold settlement uh, among them, 
as, at least as a goal, then you would get to a stable system. The other thing, though, that you have to do, which these, art, these articles obviously don't talk about, you've got to relaunch world trade. Uh, one of the reasons currencies in general are in bad shape, right? When, when gold goes up to uh, 1050 or 1055 against the dollar, 1055, that's a vote of confidence in all forms of paper, because the, the, the euro doesn't do very well either. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons is there's not enough demand for currency because world trade has collapsed by about 35 to 40 percent compared to last year, which means we're in a depression. If you 